So we have seven o'clock. And also, I want to let everybody know that we are recording this. Um, I am asking you to keep your cameras off um, and you are muted just to help facilitate the sound for all of the participants um, and also to help the video. We have a lot of people joining us tonight, so I'm really glad to see this great turnout. Um, my name is Linda Briggs Thompson. I'm the Environmental Program Manager at Broward County Parks. Welcome to our virtual workshop called Living with Coyotes. It's sponsored by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Broward County Parks and Recreation, and Broward County Animal Care. Let's see. Um, this, I don't have the ability to do um, captions for a uh, closed caption. I just got a question on that. However, we are recording this, so I will work with our uh, marketing department and see what we can do. So if you need to get a copy of this, you can email me. I was the name of the link for the invitation and we will work with getting a closed caption of this video. A um, Couple other housekeeping things to note. Of course, as I said, everyone's muted and please do keep your cameras off. Um, after the presentation, we will have some time for questions. What we're going to ask you to do is to use the chat feature. It's down in the bottom middle of your screen. Hopefully you've zoomed enough to have experience using it, but if not, if you have a question, just look for that button that says chat and go ahead and type in your question. We'll get to as many of the questions as possible. We are um, planning to have this all wrapped up by 8 p.m. just so that we can be you know, good stewards of your time tonight and you can see where we're headed with this presentation. So it is my delight to introduce to you Angeline Barker. She is a wildlife biologist who works for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission as a biological scientist for, and she will be speaking with us today about living with coyotes in Broward County. So pass it on to you, Angeline. Thanks, Linda. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us this evening. Um, again, I'm Angeline Barker. I'm a wildlife biologist with FWC. Um, for those of you who don't know FWC, we are the State Wildlife Regulatory Agency. Um, most folks know FWC from hunting and fishing, um, but the agency is a lot more than that. We do land management. We remove exotic species like pythons and tegus out of the Everglades. We're involved in coral reef research and red tide research. Um, and we're also involved with conflict wildlife or wildlife that can be conflicts to humans. And that's where my job is. Uh, most Floridians, if they're going to have a problem with the species, they tend to have a problem with alligators. And lucky for me, there's another side of the agency that handles alligator issues. But any other terrestrial wildlife species that a person might have a problem with, my staff and I are tasked with helping people mitigate those issues with those animals. So think black bears and bats and snakes and sandhill cranes, um, foxes, raccoons, and today's topic, coyotes. Um, so I'm gonna roll right into this presentation. Linda, give me just a second to share my screen. I wanna make sure everything's functioning before I move right on through it. And let's see here. Let me change my display settings real quick. So you should be able to see the title slide. Is that right, Linda? Okay, great. Um, if at any point you can't hear me, Linda, please jump in, stop me. If I get choppy, if I need to repeat, please don't hesitate to jump in. Okay, so uh, the title of our presentation tonight is Coyotes in Florida. Uh, this presentation was produced in part by Dr. Marty Main with the University of Florida, who's one of the leading coyote researchers in the state. So let's get right into it. We are often asked at FWC, why are coyotes here? They didn't used to be here in Florida. And there's some truth to that. When the Spanish first came and colonized Florida, there were no coyotes here, but there were red wolves. Red wolves were extirpated from Florida and most of the East Coast by the 1920s due to persecution. Um, and I want to take you back into wildlife history a little bit. In the 19th century, predators were wiped out and removed from most of the landscape in North America. So think wolves, coyotes, bears, panthers, cougars, alligators. Um, most big predators were systematically removed off of the landscape by humans. And we realize now 
that that wasn't the best thing for our environment. That we really we really damaged the environment by doing that, and we damaged ecosystems. And one of the the things that happened is coyote expansion. And let me give me a second, and I'll explain. Where you typically have high wolf populations, you tend to have lower coyote populations because wolves predate on coyotes and they compete with coyotes. So as we systematically, we as in society, systematically removed wolves from their historic range, gray wolves in the Western US, red wolves in the Eastern US, this allowed coyotes to start expanding their range from the Western United States to the Eastern United States. Now, while the wolves are being persecuted, I don't want you to think that the coyotes got a pass. They didn't. Everything we did that nearly drove wolves to extinction, we were doing to coyotes too. Yet coyotes expanded their range across the nation. I want you to keep that in mind as we move through the presentation today. So part of the reasons coyotes expanded into Florida was the eradication of wolves throughout their historic range. The second reason coyotes expanded their range into Florida was our conversion to an agricultural landscape, especially across the Mississippi River Delta. As we started converting to ag, pastures and, fed and fields and meadows started emerging. This is where coyotes really like to be. Coyotes can live in just about any environment, but they really like these open pasture spaces. So this aided them in their range expansion from the Western United States to the Eastern United States. So this map is a recent publication by Hody and Kays and in color is by decade, just how quickly coyotes have expanded their range. So they are now found in every state in the continental US. I also want you to know how far south coyotes have been documented. They have been documented as far south as Panama. They are almost, or they have already, crossed the Panama Canal. So they're, they almost expanded into South America. I can't think of another mid-sized mammal that has been systematically persecuted for more than a century and has yet expanded its range like the coyote has. The coyote is the ultimate example of a survivor and an adapter. And I'm going to talk to you more about why coyotes have done this as I move through the presentation, why, why they're so good at expanding their range, even though they've been systematically persecuted. So when we look at Florida specifically, the spread of coyotes into Florida, the first research project that documented coyotes in the state was by Brady and Campbell in 83. And they documented coyotes in all of the counties shaded in green. So I want you to, to notice, let me see if my cursor will come up. This one, this is Orange County. So this is the Orlando metropolitan area that have had coyotes for more than 30 years. Woody and Hardesty by 1990 recorded coyotes in all of these counties. So Broward County has had coyotes documented since 1990. That's quite a long time. Since survey data done by Dr. Main with the University of Florida confirmed coyotes in Sarasota and Volusia counties, carcass data done by Dr. Main confirmed coyotes in a couple other counties in Southern and Central Florida, and personal communication with Dr. Main and FWC has confirmed coyotes in all 67 counties in the state. So it really does not matter where you are. You could be in the Everglades, you could be in downtown Miami, you could be in Jacksonville, you could be in Orlando, you could still run into a coyote. Every county in the state, including our, some of our most heavily urbanized areas, have coyote populations. Our most southern observation to date was in Key Largo in 2011. So there's a couple important things about Key Largo. The first is that's where the largest feral cat colony in the state is located. So big guess what drew the coyotes to Key Largo. The other thing about Key Largo is obviously it's an island, right? So how did the coyotes get there? They either used the bridges and the roadways or they swam. And it turns out coyotes are fairly strong swimmers. Um, this is a photo taken in 2018 from the Lake Worth Lagoon. 
what I really like about this picture is that there's a channel marker in the background behind that coyote. So you can tell just how far out he is. We've gotten pictures recently from Longboat Key of coyotes, coyotes crossing Sarasota Bay. There are coyotes on Sanibel and Captiva now, on Siesta Key, on Longboat, on some of our smaller barrier islands. Um, so again, really, it doesn't matter where you are in Florida, you have a good chance of seeing a, seeing a coyote. Now, I want to talk a little bit about coyote biology. I, I really don't want to bore you with a lot of biology, but it's important to know a little bit just to understand what coyotes are doing in your community today. Coyotes are omnivorous, which means they're going to eat just about anything. And I'm going to talk more about that in a second. They are highly adaptable. This is one of the most intelligent wildlife species that's living in our area today. Adult coyotes range in size from about 25 to 40 pounds. So they're about the size of mid-sized dog. Uh, now their home range is variable. So in a natural area, so if you think Western Broward County, like the Everglades, uh, their home range is gonna be about 15 square miles. But in an urban area like Fort Lauderdale or Tamarack, their territory is gonna get real small. It's gonna shrink. It's only gonna be about three square miles. The reason why it gets smaller in urban areas is because they can find more food around people than they could if they were out in the Everglades. So they don't need such a big area to patrol. They don't need a big territory. Everything they need is in a smaller space. Coyotes mate in the winter. So about January, February, they have pups in the spring. So right about now, um, adult coyotes, adult female coyotes are giving birth to pups. Litter size is on average about six, but this is dependent on food. The more food that's available to them, the more young they can support. The less food that's available, the less young they can support. And then this is the story for most wildlife species. Now, unlike most wildlife species, coyotes are monogamous. They mate for life. They have really very strong pair bonds with each other. Um, and both parents care for the young. This is kind of unusual. Um, with canines. So think about domestic dogs for a moment. There is no monogamy in domestic dogs and the male domestic dog has no parental responsibilities at all. Um, but male coyotes are very involved in raising their young at the den and helping to defend and raise those young at the den. Um, so that makes them quite unique in the wildlife world and in the canine world. Now, I mentioned a few minutes ago that coyotes will eat just about anything. So FWC was kind of curious what was sustaining them in Florida. So we did a diet study. We collected roadkill coyote, hunter trap, hunter shot or trap coyotes from around the state. And we looked at their gut contents. And so not surprisingly, the biggest piece of the pie here was mammal. So that's things like squirrels and rabbits and rats and mice. What was a little bit of a surprise was the vegetation part of the pie graph. I did not realize that coyotes relied on plant material as much as they do. But really the biggest surprise here was anthropogenic at 10%. So anthropogenic is human related foods. This is why coyotes are being drawn into urban areas is for food that's related to people. Now, the next couple of slides, I'm gonna show you some things that we pulled out of coyote gut um, I know it's around dinner time. Um, these pictures are not that graphic, I promise. I wouldn't do that to you, but I want to show you these pictures to give you an idea of just how variable their diet is. So first picture, this is dog food. Uh, so dog food is high in calories. Um, dog food is designed to be attractive to get a dog to eat it. Like dogs don't normally eat dog food. That's not their, so hear me out here. Dog food is, is made to be attractive to get dogs to eat it, to make dogs want to eat it. Well, it's not just attractive to dogs, it's attractive to any wildlife. It's attractive to raccoons and foxes and coyotes and everything. So this coyote, how did he get dog food? We don't know. We don't know if he scavenged it. Maybe somebody left dog food out on their porch and he got into it. Maybe someone was intentionally feeding the coyote. It's hard to say, but this right here, Big reason why coyotes are coming into urban environments for easy food like this. Think how easy it is to eat dog food out of a bowl 
that's way easier than running down a rabbit for your meal. Okay, next picture. This is cooked chicken. So how exactly did the coyote get cooked chicken? Again, did someone intentionally feed this animal? Did he get into some trash? Hard to say, but this slide right here is really indicative why coyotes like urban areas. I also want you to notice where that coyote that had the cooked chicken in its system came from. Pinellas County, so St. Pete, Clearwater, the most densely human populated county in the state. If coyotes can live there, they can live anywhere. Okay, next picture. This is a coyote's stomach and it's a kind of weird color, it's purple. Uh, we think this coyote's stomach was purple because he was eating pokeweed. Pokeweed is a native plant. It has bright purple berries on it. It's really important for songbird migration. This coyote ate so much that it stained its stomach purple. So that's some of the vegetation component that we were surprised to see. Okay, next picture, this is a McDonald's wrapper. Uh, I want you to notice where this animal came from. This animal was hit by a car in the Ocala National Forest. So this is a big piece of public land and this coyote still managed to find trash. How did he do that? Uh, did he hit the McDonald's dumpster next to the National Forest? Did somebody bring trash in? Who knows? Um, but this, this, was, this was really surprising to me. Same with our next picture. Here is a mini eggs wrapper from a state park. So again, a public, a, a tract of public land that's more natural land where you wouldn't expect a coyote to be able to find human related foods and yet they still were. Next picture, this is my favorite picture from the whole study. It's a total of 47 small mammals that were found in the stomach of one, one coyote. I want you to know it takes a coyote around five hours to digest its meal. So this coyote ate nearly 50 mice in the five hours before it died. That's incredible. From a rodent control standpoint, that is just incredible. If only they would just eat rodents. Um, and I have one more picture to share. This is the substantial amount of insects. And I want you to notice, you might not be able to see what's written on the card there in parentheses. Um, that says roaches which completely grosses me out. <laughs> um, but the idea, the point in showing you all of these pictures is they will literally eat anything. They will eat garbage, they will eat roadkill, they'll eat bird seed and pet food, uh, belly armadillos and raccoons and rabbits and whatever is available to them. This is why they are so adaptable and why they can live in, in urban areas right around us. Okay. Now, every coyote that came into that research project was weighed, and this graph shows you the actual weights of those animals. The reason I'm bringing this up is because we are consistently getting phone calls from the public telling us that they're seeing 60 and 70 and 80 pound coyotes. And from our research, we're showing that coyotes are not that large. Um, either the public is overestimating their weight, which is easy to do. Coyotes are leggy, they're long. If they're shedding, they can look bigger than they really are. Or the public might be seeing a dog that's bred to look like a wolf or bred to look like a coyote. And there are some wolf dog hybrids out there that are bred that way. What our research is showing is that coyotes are the same, coyotes in Florida, are the same size as the coyotes in the Western United States. In this study, they average about 27 pounds. So they're not really as large as most people think they are or that they appear to be. Okay, are there any ecological benefits to having coyotes in Florida? What's good, is there anything good about having them here? Well, one potentially good thing about coyotes is they contribute to our native wildlife viewing and listening. Um, some people really like to hear coyotes howling and singing at night. It reminds them of being connected with nature and close and close to the wild, even if you're not close to the wild. Some people really also don't like to hear that, but some people really do. Additionally, if you can catch a scene like this or an adult is tending their young at the den, it is rather endearing. And as I mentioned, coyotes are really good parents, both adults and sometimes one of their offspring from the previous year will hang around to help them raise their pups of the, of the year. So coyotes absolutely contribute to the aesthetics of viewing wildlife, which is important to many of us. 
Coyotes also can prey on smaller predators. Now, there are some scientists that think that coyotes are filling the role that the red wolf left behind. So remember, the red wolf was extirpated out of Florida by, 19, by 1920. So Florida has been without a mid-level canine predator for around 100 years. There are some scientists that think that the coyote is filling that void or that ecological niche that the red wolf left behind. So let me give you an example. Let's take raccoons. You can have as many as 25 raccoons per square mile in some cases, and that's not if they're being artificially fed. And raccoons are really good at one thing besides getting in trash. Raccoons are really good nest predators. That's their MO. They are very efficient nest predators. If coyotes are helping to control raccoons, they are indirectly helping some of our threatened and endangered bird species that raccoons might be preying on, like roseate spoonbills, like bobwhite quail, like model ducks. Now, this does not mean that if a coyote came across a bobwhite quail nest that he wouldn't eat it, he'd totally eat it. Uh, but they're typically, coyotes typically aren't looking for nesting birds like they're looking for raccoons. So because of this, again, some scientists think Coyotes may be contributing to a more balanced ecosystem in Florida. Okay, but what about negative ecological impacts? What's, what could be bad about having coyotes in Florida from an ecological standpoint? So they could compete with native predators. They could compete with Florida panthers. So Florida panthers, I'm sure as you know, are one of the most endangered species um, in North America today. Coyotes and panthers also kind of like to eat the same, same food sources. They both like to eat hog and they both like to eat deer. But panthers tend to eat older age class deer and hog, while coyotes eat younger age class deer and hog. Additionally, they don't really like to live in the same place. Coyotes like big pastures and meadows and fields and they like living around people, where panthers really don't like living around people and they like dense forests. They like to be away from people. Also, even though the Florida panther is still endangered, their population has been slowly increasing. If coyotes were negatively impacting panthers, we would expect to see the panther population decline, and it's not. And finally, panthers' close cousins, uh, the puma or the cougar, mountain lion, the one that lives out west, frequently catches and kills coyotes. We feel that panthers would, could and do I don't think we've documented it, but we feel that panthers would absolutely do the same thing in Florida. So based on all of that, we don't think coyotes are negatively impacting panthers at this time. But we have another native cat here, the bobcat. Bobcats are around the same size as coyotes. They like to live in the same environment. They like to eat the same things. So Dr. Barney Main with the University of Florida wanted to answer the question of, do bobcats and coyotes compete with each other? So he put radio collars on several animals in the center part of the state at the Avon Park bombing range and tracked their movements. And what you see from this funky looking map, in blue, what you're looking at are coyote territories. And in red, you're looking at bobcat territories. And I want you to notice, and let me move my cursor over here. You see the striped area here? This is representing a bobcat's denning site and the polka dotted part right here is representing a coyote's denning site. So what you can take away from this map is that coyote and bobcat territories overlap with each other by a lot, right? Look at how this red bobcat territory is over like three coyote territories, but their denning sites don't overlap. They're backed up to each other in some places like right here and right here, but they're not overlapping. And what that is suggesting is that they're coexisting. They're living in the same environment, uh, but they're not out competing each other, which is pretty interesting. Now, no one has looked into this, to my knowledge, in an urban environment, how coyotes and bobcats are interacting with each other. But one of my staff put out a trail camera um, in Hillsborough County, so just outside of Tampa, uh, to help a gentleman who was losing turkeys. Uh, so we put out a camera to determine what might, what predator might be moving on his property. And we had a bobcat and a coyote on the same camera in the same evening. Now this is kind of anecdotal evidence, but this is suggesting that they are possibly coexisting with each other in more urban environments too. 
As a side note, we also got red foxes and opossums on this camera in the same evening as well. Now, another potentially negative thing about coyotes is that they can predate on our rare and endangered species. And I just said a couple of minutes ago that they can help some of our rare and endangered species, but they can hurt some of our rare and endangered species too. If coyotes learn to target ground nesting species like sea turtles, like shorebirds, like burrowing owls, coyotes can be impactful to those animals, to those rare and endangered species. And beach managers sometimes have to make decisions on removing predators from the beach to the, for the benefit of threatened and endangered species. But it's usually a difficult decision because remember what coyotes are good at. Coyotes are good at eating small, small predators like raccoons. Raccoons are more efficient nest predators than coyotes. So if a beach manager removed a coyote from the beach because it was predating sea turtles, it may, they may open the door to allowing raccoons in because that predators, uh, that coyote predator is not there anymore. And those raccoons may have more of a detriment than the coyotes had to start with. Uh, so these are things, some things that some folks need to consider and do consider um, when they are protecting our rare and endangered species. Now, for most of you this evening, I kind of think you came out here and came on this presentation to talk about human conflicts as it relates to coyotes. And that's what I'm gonna spend the rest of my time on this evening. But before I dive into human, too much on human conflicts, I do wanna say that in my opinion, I think coyotes have a really undeserved public reputation. And there is a, there's a reason for it. I think there are some myths and misconceptions about coyotes that drive the really negative public reputation. So one is their size. Um, I mentioned a few minutes ago, they're not nearly as large as most folks think, think they are. They're about the size mid-sized dog, 25 to 40 pounds. Pax is another one. So I really dislike using the word to pack when I talk about coyotes. When I, when I hear the word pack, I think of a bunch of unrelated animals that get together to do bad things. So feral dogs is a good example, right? So feral dogs, when they pack up, they're not usually related to each other. And feral dogs do bad things like running livestock. Coyotes are territorial. The only coyotes they allow within their territory is their family. That's it. The alpha male and female and their offspring. Um, if you're not part of that family group, you're not coming in the territory. So coyotes, it's to me, it's better to not to say packs since they're all related, except for the alpha male and female, they're moving in family groups. So if you ever see more than one together, you're looking at it with its mate or with its young of the year. So in this picture, for example, we took this picture on a golf course in Clearwater. I think this coyote in the center is the alpha male. One of the two behind him is the alpha female and the other is their sibling or their, excuse me, their offspring from the previous year. And sometimes their offspring will hang back and help the adults raise the pups of the next generation. Koi dogs and koi wolves are another one. So a koi dog is when a coyote and a dog breed together and have offspring. Koi dogs have been documented in the Western United States. They have not been documented in Florida. Uh, it's kind of hard to get a koi dog, partially because coyote and dogs breeding cycles don't really link up. Coyotes breed in the winter, that's it. Dogs breed in the spring and in the fall. Because their cycles aren't linked up, it can be difficult for them to interbreed with each other. Additionally, it would be a really bad move for a female coyote to breed with a male dog. Because remember, coyotes are monogamous, they mate for life, and the male coyote is very involved in raising his young. If a female coyote chooses a male dog, that dog's not hanging around. That dog's not going to help her raise the offspring, which means the offspring have less chances of surviving um, than if she had chosen a coyote to breed with. And really, coyotes, there's no shortage of coyotes. Coyotes aren't going to choose a dog to breed with if there's another coyote that they can have a pair bond with and remain monogamous too. So uh, now a koi wolf is when a coyote and a wolf breed together and have offspring. 
There is a lot of research going on on the eastern seaboard, especially in the northeastern United States, trying to answer this question of whether koi wolves exist. As of now, all the evidence in Florida points to no, specifically because there are no and have been no wolves or coyotes to breed with. Coyotes in, in Florida are mimicking the coyotes in the Western United States in their size. Um, disease is another one. So sometimes when folks see coyotes that are a different color, like this one that's black, they'll assume that it's disease, that it's not. Um, or if they see a coyote out during the day, some people will assume it's disease. And I want you, you probably notice almost every picture I've shown you today have been day active coyotes. Coyotes are typically nocturnal, but it's not unusual for them to come out during the day. And coming out during the day is not a sign of disease. Now, that's not to say that coyotes don't carry diseases. They do. They carry, can carry the same diseases that you would vaccinate your dog for. So they can get rabies, they can get distemper, they can get parvo, they can get mange and heartworm and, and ticks and fleas. They can get all that. But just because you see a coyote out during the day or just because you see a coyote that's a little different in coloration does not mean it's the diseased animal. And finally, Hollywood and wily coyotes always make us think that coyotes are up to no good, but they're really just trying to survive in a pretty tough environment. Now let's move into some of the other human conflicts. Predation of livestock can also be a pretty big human conflict. Now, this is not typical. This is typically done by a coyote that's learned. Not What I'm trying to get at is not every coyote predates livestock. And for ranchers that have smaller operations, there are some things they can do to, pre excuse me, to prevent predation, not just by coyotes, but by other wildlife, like using electric fencing, like using corrals, or like using guard animals. Um, turns out donkeys and llamas really hate canines and will run coyote, coyotes and, and dogs for that matter off properties. So there are some things that ranchers can do to help prevent predation, not just by coyotes, but by other wildlife. We have found that systematically removing coyotes because of a fear of predating livestock doesn't really work. When coyotes are suppressed, they can increase their reproductive output. They can start having more pups per litter. So all of a sudden, where you might have only had a few coyotes, now you're going to have a whole lot more because those surviving coyotes are increasing in reproduction. That's part of the reason why coyotes are really good at surviving and part of the reason why they've expanded their range across the U.S. as well. However, I kind of think most of you are here this evening because of urban coyotes and pet loss. And I don't want to sugarcoat it for you. Coyotes and other wildlife, other predators will absolutely predate pets if they are free ranging. So let's start with cats. Cats are open to predation anytime they are free ranging. So whether this is a house cat that gets to go inside and outside or it's a feral cat, if it is outside, it is at risk of being predated, not just by coyotes. Coyotes get the most notoriety. Bobcats take free ranging cats. Panthers take free ranging cats. Alligators take free ranging cats. Crocodiles take free ranging cats if you live south of Broward County or in crocodile country. There's a lot of bad things that can happen to cats and it's not just wildlife related. Cats can get hit by cars, they can pick up diseases, they can, they can be poisoned, they can get stuck in sewers and, and other weird things. Anytime a cat is free ranging, it's at risk of predation. The best way to keep cats safe is by keeping them indoors. Small dogs can also be at risk of predation by coyotes and other wildlife. Typically for coyotes, when a coyote takes a small dog, it's not on a leash, it's not with a person, and it's not in a fenced in yard. Um, normally this happens at dusk or dawn, little dog, and by little dog, I'm talking 20 pounds and under, Little dog is let outside to go to the bathroom. Nobody goes outside with him. He's not on a leash. He's not in a fenced yard. Coyote happens to be there and takes advantage of the opportunity. It is heartbreaking when we hear about wildlife predating pets. As a pet owner myself, it is absolutely heartbreaking. Um, however, there are some things you can do to prevent it. 
So with cats, as I mentioned, keeping them inside. For dogs, it's keeping them on short leashes with you when you're outdoors or in a well fenced in yard. And by short leash, I mean six feet or less. Not one of those retractable leashes where your dog can be like 20 feet away from you. That is not, th that's not secure. If, you're, if your small dog is on a retractable leash that's all the way out at the end and comes nose to nose with a cane toad or a venomous snake or another dog or a coyote or gets in the road, you have you have zero recourse. You have no time and there's no there's nothing you can do to prevent that interaction, which is why we recommend a leash six foot or less. For a coyote to approach a person that's walking a dog, that's risky. That's very risky. And that's not something we typically hear of coyotes doing. To approach a person that's standing between five and six feet tall that outweighs them by quite a lot, um, that's not typically a risk a coyote is going to want to take. They typically want to go the easy route. Now, I mentioned earlier, it's not just coyotes that predate pets. We know other predators predate pets too. And so by taking the advice I'm giving you, you can prevent predation, not just by coyotes, but by other predators. And you might be thinking, well, if I live in Fort Lauderdale, what kind of other predators are there? If I'm in an extremely urban environment, right? Remember that camera picture I showed you earlier, the trail camera picture from Hillsborough County? where we had a bobcat on that camera and a coyote on the camera. I also had a cat on that camera. Look at what time the cat was there in relation to what time the coyote was there. The cat was there like eight minutes before the coyote showed up. The bobcat was there earlier in the evening. I don't know if this was a landowner's cat, feral cat. I have no idea. I don't know if this cat survived either. I'm showing you this to drive home the point that it's not just coyotes living in your environment. Predators are learning to adapt and learn to learning to live around us. Bobcats are really good at it. And they're kind of, I don't want to say sneaky, but most people don't know the bobcats are around. They're a bit quieter about, about being in an urban environment. So it's not just coyotes, it's other wildlife too. Now you might be asking yourself, well, am I safe? You know, am I safe being around coyotes? The answer to that is yes. Attacks by coyotes on humans are fairly rare. And to put it into perspective, I have broken out coyote attacks versus dog attacks on the slide to you, for you. So let's take coyotes to start with. Between 1970 and 2015, in the US and Canada, there were approximately nine people attacked by coyotes per year. Most of these people were doing something they shouldn't have been doing, like feeding the coyote a hot dog, or they were the victim of someone doing something they shouldn't be doing. Like somebody fed the coyote previously, coyote got aggressive and bit somebody, uh, bit somebody else that wasn't doing the wrong thing. In that same time frame, two people have been killed by coyotes. Now, compare that to domestic dogs. There was more than a thousand emergency room visits in this country every day from dog bites. There are 5 million cases a year that require medical treatment. And between 2013 and 2018, more than 200 people were killed by domestic dogs in the United States alone. Statistically, your chances of being bitten by a coyote, especially if you're doing everything right, is very, very low. Now, you might be at the point of asking yourself, or asking me rather, can't we just get rid of them? Can't just the coyotes all go away? And you might know the answer to that before I say it, and the answer is no. Um, Coyotes are here to stay. Eradication efforts have been tried by other states and they have failed dramatically. Eradication of coyotes has proven to be expensive, inefficient, and ineffective. Remember, coyotes have been persecuted by people for more than a century. Everything we were doing to wolves, and we nearly drove wolves to extinction, we were doing to coyotes, and yet coyotes expanded their range to every state in the continental U.S. in that same time frame. They're territorial with high replacement. They're adaptable and they're intelligent. They are here to stay. So what happens if you have a nuisance coyote? So let me define nuisance for a second. The state defines nuisance as an animal's behavior. So an entire species is not a nuisance, but we define species by behavior. State defines nuisance as an animal that is about to cause or has caused property damage, is a threat to public safety, 
or is an annoyance in, under, or upon a building. So let's say, for example, you had a coyote break onto your screen and porch and cause property damage to try to take your cat. You could remove that as a landowner, you could remove that coyote as a nuisance. So what does that look like? What is the landowner, what's the landowner's options to removing a nuisance coyote? So the first option is to use a trap, a live trap, a cage trap, a box trap. You've probably seen one for raccoons or for squirrels. Uh, it looks like this in the slide. You need a really big one to catch a coyote. Um, this is a very difficult way to catch a coyote. Coyotes are notoriously difficult to capture, especially in a cage trap. They're too smart for this. Most professional trappers I've talked to in the state of Florida have, had, have not had success catching a coyote in a cage trap unless it's really young and it doesn't know any better or it's diseased and it's desperate. To catch a, an adult coyote in a cage trap, it's probably not gonna happen. So your next option is to use a snare. So a snare is a cable restraint that's designed to catch the animal around its foot or around its neck. Usually for a coyote, it's designed to catch it around its neck. This just can't go up in a backyard and be effective. Like, how, how do you get them to walk through that? This needs to go on a pinch, like a fence line, a, a hedge row, somewhere where the coyote is moving through consistently. This takes some finesse it, and really takes a professional. Uh, snares can catch non-target species. So anything that walks through that snare has the potential to be captured. So if your neighbor's dog walks through it or a skunk or a fox, Bobcat, anything has the potential, and depending on how the snare is set, it has the, has the potential to be lethal. Because of that, this is a really unpopular option to use in urban environments. So the third option is to use a foothold. So let me clarify and say, for anything else, footholds require a permit or a steel trap, require a permit from FWC, all right? So this is a trap that just can't be used by anybody, requires a permit by FWC. A foothold for a coyote is about the size of your hand. So about the size of the palm of your hand. The idea here is the coyote puts his foot there, the foothold closes and it grabs and holds the animal um, about at the wrist area. This just can't go, go in your backyard be effective either. Like how do, you, how do you get him to put his foot in that small of a space? Um, this also takes the professional to use and to be effective. Just like a snare, a foothold can catch non-target species too, like anything that puts its foot there can get caught. However, footholds can release the animal with minimal injury and can release the animal alive. That's easier said than done though. I don't know about you, I would not want to let an angry bobcat out of a foothold. Um, that wouldn't be easy at all, but in theory you could. My point in showing you all three of these options is to drive home that coyotes are really difficult to trap. They are, even for professional trappers, and it's even harder when you're in an urban environment. FWC is promoting preventing problems before they start with coyotes, but because if it gets to the point where you're here bringing in a trapper to try to catch a coyote, your chances of success are not very good. And that's not because you might that's not because the trapper is ineffective or inefficient. It's because coyotes are really hard to trap. So how do you how do you prevent problems with coyotes before they start? You can start by not feeding them. Anything that attracts a dog, a cat, or a raccoon will attract a coyote, and it is illegal to feed coyotes in Florida. So how do you secure those attractants? You keep your garbage inside of a garage or a shed or a sturdy trash can until the morning of trash day. Try to put it out on the curb the morning of trash day instead of the night before. That gives wildlife less opportunity to get into it. Clean up fallen fruit, pet food, and bird feeders. You saw in the slide I showed you earlier that that coyote had eaten dog food. Remember, dog food is, and cat food for that matter, it's very high in calories and the coyotes have to expend zero energy other than walking up to it to get it. For a coyote, that's very smart to target pet food, but that's what's drawing them into our, our urban environments. Keep cats indoors. If cats are inside, they are safe from predation and a lot of other perils. And keep dogs on leashes and supervise when they're outside, especially small dogs, and please not a retractable leash. 
you can also haze coyotes. So I know hazing is a funny term and most people associate that with fraternities. Um, what I mean by hazing is scaring the coyote away. If you see a coyote in your neighborhood or in your yard, you don't have to let its presence go unnoticed. Um, what I'm finding, and this is anecdotal, is when people see coyotes, they do one of a couple of things. They go, ah, it's a coyote, and they do nothing. Or they go, oh my gosh, it's a coyote, and they get in their car, and they get in their house, and they take pictures. But the coyote in both of those scenarios is learning that people people aren't a threat to it. People aren't going to do anything bad to it. So the coyotes are learning that they can hang out in urban areas around people. And that's not, not really what we want either. Hazing establishes some human dominance and lets that animal know that, you know, it, you know what? It needs to yield to you. It needs to run away from people. It needs to be driven out of the area. It does not need to be hanging out on the sidewalk or in your driveway. So if you're comfortable, you can haze coyotes using any of the methods that are listed on this slide. Now, sometimes if you haze a coyote and it's never been hazed before, they'll stand there and they'll look at you like you're crazy. Um, it's happened to me, that's kind of normal. The coyote's trying to figure it out. The, the idea behind hazing is you wanna make that animal feel uncomfortable and unwanted. You wanna make it move out of your view. You wanna keep hazing, this is a good point. You wanna keep hazing until you can't see the animal anymore. Because if you stop hazing, if, when the coyote turns its back, it's gonna realize, oh, okay, all I gotta do is turn around and that crazy person is gonna stop yelling at me. You wanna keep going, keep driving that animal until you can no longer see it. The last option on the slide is bear spray. You should not use bear spray unless you're in a situation that is a little bit more serious. Uh, I like, our, our bear biologists call this a nuclear option. If you see a coyote at 60 yards and you deploy bear spray, it's going to do nothing. Bear spray is only effective if the animal's close, like within 15 or 30 feet. Um, bear spray comes out in a fog ahead of you. It's a little bit easier to use than pepper spray. Pepper spray usually comes out in a little stream and you have to have good aim. Bear spray comes out in a fog. So if a coyote were to be approaching you in a predatory manner, let's say for your dog, and you were to deploy bear spray, within about 15 feet, the coyote's gonna have to walk through a cloud of capsaicin pepper. Capsaicin pepper causes the animal's respiratory system to close. So it's gonna go from, I wanna check out this dog to I can't breathe anymore. You need to be smart before you deploy it. Um, you need to know which way the wind's blowing for sure. Um, it could blow back into your face or your dog's face, which wouldn't be good to use at all. So keep that in mind. If you're, if you're going to carry bear spray, you should not use this um, unless you're, like I said, that animal was within about 15 to 30 feet of you. We produced a video on how to haze coyotes. I'm not going to play it here because it comes over glitchy with the webinar, but I want to direct you to our website where you can find it. Hazing video is about three minutes long. You're going to see some person standing on a golf course, uh, waving their arms at a black coyote. That's me. <laughs> um, and I want you to notice that coyote's reaction when I started hazing it. I can guarantee that animal never been hazed before, but it immediately popped up. It looked, gave me this bewildered look and moved off from me. And that's the reaction we want. Um, we, we, we want you, if you're comfortable, to haze coyotes, to drive them out of your view, uh, to make them learn that hanging around people is not okay. Now, if you do everything I just asked or suggested, you secure your attractants, you secure your pets, you haze the coyotes, the coyotes aren't moving out. There's other natural foods holding them to the area like rodents and raccoons and roaches, um, but they are gonna start becoming more respectful of people. They're gonna start to learn that, okay, if I come around these people, I'm gonna get this negative experience. So I really shouldn't come around these people. They might start shifting their activity to coming out at night instead of coming out during the day. Because if they come out during the day, they have more chances of an encounter with a person that they don't want. Additionally, those coyotes, remember, they're territorial. So they're gonna keep other coyotes out. So it's almost like you're training your resident coyotes and teaching them that being around people is not cool and not okay. So I'm gonna summarize, I'm gonna, 
I'm watching my time here. So I want to go ahead and wrap this up. So we have time for questions. So I want to leave you with some facts and some advice. So some facts, adult coyotes weigh between 25 and 40 pounds. They occur in every state and nearly every large city in the United States. There are coyotes in DC. There are coyotes in New York City and in Dallas and Los Angeles and Chicago. Attacks by coyotes on humans are exceedingly rare. Coyotes will kill cats and small dogs if given the opportunity. Don't give them the opportunity or other wildlife. And coyotes can carry rabies, but this is also pretty rare. We've only had two coyotes test positive for rabies in Florida. Some advice, don't feed them. <laughs> um, whether this is directly, like giving it a hot dog or indirectly, like leaving out garbage in a manner that attracts the coyote in, please don't feed them. And it is illegal to feed coyotes and raccoons and foxes and black bears and alligators and a couple other species in Florida. Prevent access to garbage and pet food. Keep cats indoors. Have small dogs in a short leash or in a well-fenced in yard. Follow those hazing recommendations to consistently frighten coyotes away. And in the unlikely event that you were to have a coyote approach you in a predatory manner, you'd wanna lift up your, pop, your pet or your child off the ground and be prepared to defend yourself. The absolute worst thing you can do if you see a coyote is run. Please don't run. Uh, coyotes will give chase just like a dog would or any other predator. If you run, they're going to chase. Please don't run. If you have a problem with a coyote in Florida, call us. Uh, my staff and I are available. The South Regional Office uh, serves Broward County. The number is on your screen. Please call us if you have a problem with a coyote in Florida. We will troubleshoot with you. If you feel that someone is illegally, or a doesn't matter if it's illegal, someone's feeding coyotes, which is illegal in Florida, you can call our Wildlife Alert Hotline. That's the second number on your screen. That number is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can report anonymously if you wish. If you're a landowner that has a coyote that meets the nuisance definition and you wish to have it removed, you can hire a trapper. And there's a list of trappers on our website. But keep in mind what I mentioned earlier about trapping coyotes, that it's very difficult. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. I really appreciate you guys hanging out with me for an hour you know, during the week. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Linda, I think we have some time for questions. Yeah, thank you so much. That was great. Um, really enjoyed that. And I think most of the people really enjoyed it as well. We, we got mostly just comments um, throughout the presentation. However, we did get just now a question about, I just lost my chat, here we go. Okay, we're getting questions now. So Angeline, how can you tell a dog apart from a coyote? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the easiest way for me is to look for a collar. If you see a collar, then you know it's a, it's a dog. Um, coyotes tend to hold their tails kind of like at half mast um, and coyote sizes is another good way to tell between a dog. Um, if it really looks like it's over 60 pounds, there's a good shot at the dog. Worst case scenario, if you're really unsure, take a picture. Uh, we're happy to help you identify it. Speaking of, could you please put up the slide with the numbers on it, the contact information? We got that question as well. Yes, give me one second. I will share my screen again. All right. Okay, great. And then we got another question about the difference between a fox and a coyote. Oh, that's um, a great question. Yeah, can you describe the difference? Um, actually, I think I might have a slide that's hidden with a picture. Do I? No, I don't. Um, so we have two species of foxes in Florida. We have red foxes and gray foxes. Um, a fox tops out usually at 12 to 15 pounds. So they're pretty small. Um, Gray foxes are gray mottled in color with rusty red behind their ears, where red foxes are rusty red all over with a bright white tip at the end of their tail. Um, so the size difference is the best way to tell the two apart. Even young coyotes are typically larger um, than adult foxes. Okay, if, you ever, if you're ever not sure what you're seeing, like I said, feel free to take a picture. We'll identify it for you. 
Excellent. We're getting a lot of comments about what a great presentation this is. Um, another question about is there the possibility of future domestic domestication? Maybe man's best new best friend. Could they be domesticated? No, coyotes, that's a great question. Coyotes have um, not done well with domestication. I don't know if they've been tried to be domesticated, but I know people have tried to keep them as pets and they don't make good pets at all. That's a great question though. Okay, good. And um, we are taping this. So if you need to get a copy of it, you can reach out um, to me uh, directly. My email is lbriggs. See my last name up there, B-R-I-G-G-S, lbriggs at broward.org. Um, some more questions coming in. Is it legal to shoot coyotes? Is it legal to shoot coyotes? It is legal to shoot a coyote on your land or if you're hunting coyotes like on a management area, if you can legally discharge a firearm. And I, I wanna stress that. Um, you have to follow all other firearm laws if you're going to shoot a coyote. Um, you should check with your sheriff's, your local sheriff's office, the Broward County Sheriff's Office before discharging a firearm. Um, and I, I, I would suggest if you're in an urban area, it's really not going to be an option for you. Okay, good. And then you may not know this, but um, there is a question about whether the Fort Lauderdale Airport contacted FWC before they shot the coyote on the runway. I don't know about that situation. Have you heard that one? I'm not aware of that scenario. I, I can tell you that airports can take wildlife if they are an imminent threat to aircraft. Um, so I, again, I'm not familiar with that particular scenario, but if the coyote was on the runway and the plane was trying to take off or trying to land, um, they may have had no choice other than to remove the animal lethally. Okay, good. And another question, where can they see the hazing video? Yeah, where can they see the hazing video? So let me back up my slide here. Uh, you can go to myfwc.com slash coyote. It's a little ways down the page, or you can go to YouTube and type in FWC coyote hazing video and it should, should pop up. Okay, we're getting a lot of messages in, so um, bear with me a few more. If people could, um, if people put out food for any wildlife, not necessarily for feeding coyotes, is there anything that can be done? Anything can be done. I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'll, I'll answer it the way I, I think. Yeah, I, think I think they're saying like, can can is there any enforcement? Like, can if somebody's putting out food? Um, sure. So, so if someone's putting out food for um, for a dog, let's say, and a coyote comes in as a, and is attracted to it, FWC can can come out and enforce that, even though the target was not a coyote coyote was brought in in that scenario and we can enforce that um there are it's not illegal to feed all wildlife in florida but there are some species it is illegal to feed uh, i rattled a few off earlier but just for the, the sake of, of conversation black bears coyotes raccoons foxes alligators sandhill cranes pelicans and i'm probably forgetting a couple of others um but if if for example someone left um bird seed out and a raccoon came in even though they weren't targeting the raccoon they were targeting the birds that is something we can address okay good um approximately how many coyotes are in florida oh that's a great question i wish i knew the answer to that <laughs> um, there are no research studies going on on coyote populations in florida um i wish i knew the answer to that question all indications are that their populations are stable but i don't have a number for you Okay, and then do you know anybody that treats injured coyotes, if somebody finds an injured coyote? Yes, in Broward County, I um, believe it is the South Florida Wildlife Center um, treats injured coyotes. Um, Bush Wildlife Sanctuary up in Jupiter, so it's a little little north of you, um, also treats injured coyotes. So there, that's two local ones. I'm sure there are others. Those are just the two that popped into my head real quick. Okay, and um, let's see, uh, do they eat? Iguanas. Do they eat iguanas? <laughs> um, we actually had this discussion on another presentation a couple weeks ago. Um, we think they can if they can catch them. Um, iguanas are pretty fast, as you guys know. Um, if a coyote can catch an iguana, we think they would absolutely eat them. And certainly they could, could catch and eat smaller ones. I don't believe we documented it, but I said they can catch them. I'm pretty sure they would eat them. We got another question about your contact information. Um, again, so maybe put that slide back up. Um, 
how, how about identifying coyote, fox, cat, and dog by how they move? Like if you were to get them on a camera for, let's say, um, they all move a little differently from each other. Um, we've gotten pretty good at identifying wildlife by shadows or by movements with some surveillance camera videos. <laughs> um, I don't know if I can describe it very well. But yes, you, you can, cats move, the so felines move differently than canids or canines do. Um, dogs tend to move a lot differently than coyotes do and foxes move a little differently too. So it, that, that's possible to tell them apart by how they move. It's a little bit more challenging, but it's doable. So um, really specific situation in Westlake Park, they, they um, usually see one coyote and it's a lone hunter. Is this unusual? No. Um, it's not unusual. A lot of times coyotes will hunt by themselves. Um, it's a little more unusual to see pairs, but it's not terribly, like, unusual is not the right word. It's not as common to see them in pairs, but it's not unusual. But seeing one lone coyote hunting, that's that's more typical. Okay, I'm going to put my um, contact information. Let's see if I can figure this out. <laughs> um, Let me stop sharing my screen. Would that be easier? Let's see. Here we go. Okay, I'm putting my my email if you um want to see about more information about the presentation. We're going we recorded it, so we're hopefully able to have it to share. There it is, lbriggs at brower.org. We just got a lot of complimentary uh, comments, and I think that was the last question. Okay. So thank you so much, Angeline. I know I really enjoyed this. I know a lot of people want more of these, <laughs> but um if we come up with more of these Zoom presentations, we'll definitely advertise them. But thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. As welcome. I really appreciate y'all everybody coming out this evening. Thank you very much. And thank you to Linda and Broward County Parks and Rec and Animal Services. This could not have happened without your partnership and you guys were, were phenomenal to work with. Thank you. You are too. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks everybody. Um, we really appreciate your time and attention. Have a great night.